Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. This is week 7 of Term 1, where we begin a new unit of study on the muscular system. The materials in this unit will come from chapters 9 and 10 of our textbook. Looking back on our last unit, we finished up a three-week unit on the skeleton and bones, where we considered the various ways bones contributed to our day-to-day -day lives, particularly how bones aid in support of our body, in protection of our organs, and in assistance with movement, both within the body as well as externally with locomotion. While bones play a significant role in our framework and provide leverage by which we can do work, they can't actually move body parts themselves. Rather, motion results from the alternating contraction and relaxation of skeletal muscles attached to bone, thus helping move our bodies. In this week's lecture, we'll look at the three types of muscular tissue we find, skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle, as well as consider the major functions of muscle. We'll consider five properties of muscle, then delve into the various components of the skeletal muscle while considering gross skeletal muscle anatomy, looking at things such as connective tissue surrounding muscles and muscle components, fascia, tendons, as well as other things. We'll then consider the five types of skeletal muscle. That is, we look at the way muscles are shaped and how they originate and insert into bone. And then we consider the seven ways by which muscles can be named. We'll move on to microscopic anatomy of skeletal muscle. We look at the three types of proteins found in skeletal muscles before looking in detail at the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. Along the way, we're going to see how calcium impacts muscle contraction, thus tying in why it was so important last unit that we look at calcium levels in the body from moment to moment. Thereafter, we take a more broad scope to consider the neuromuscular junction, that is, where the nervous system ultimately interacts with skeletal muscle to control contraction and relaxation. Finally, we close the lecture with the four steps needed for skeletal muscle contraction to occur. Again, we revisit the neuromuscular junction, we consider muscle fiber excitation, we look at excitation contraction coupling before looking at cross bridge cycling. Our introductory slide provides an overview of muscle facts. First, as it pertains to muscles, we find three prefixes that guide us to the idea of muscle as a topic. We have myo, my, and sarco. Myo and my are prefixes that are Latin for muscle, whereas sarco is Greek, and it refers to flesh or tissue and specifically is used when naming structures and organelles associated with muscle. So if you see terms with myo, my, or sarco, you should be thinking muscle. Further, when we talk of the muscle cell, we often refer to individual cells as muscle fibers. And with this in mind, we have three types of tissue to consider in this chapter. We have skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. Though we tend to focus most of our time on skeletal muscle. We'll return to cardiac muscle when we look at chapter 18 near the end of the second term of anatomy and physiology. And we'll look at smooth muscle as we consider various other body systems, including the respiratory system and the digestive system during the third term of anatomy and physiology. As mentioned in the last slide, we find three types of muscle tissue in our body, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. I'm going to briefly outline each of these three before looking at the major functions of muscle. So here, we're going to look at skeletal muscle. We begin with the general characteristics of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle fibers are long and cylindrical, and they're striated, which simply means the tissue is marked by dark and light bands as a result of repeating functional units we call sarcomeres, and we'll come back to the idea of the sarcomere later on in lecture. Skeletal muscle fibers are multinucleate, meaning we see more than one nucleus per cell, and they're voluntary. Skeletal muscles help us interact with our external environment, and it's the topic of these upcoming two chapters. Next, we have cardiac muscle, which is similar to skeletal muscle in being striated. Cardiac muscle contains one or two nuclei per cell as compared to the multiple nuclei in skeletal muscle. And fibers are branching, which is in contrast to that near-perfect cylindrical fiber shape of skeletal muscle fibers. Differing from skeletal muscle fibers, cardiac muscle fibers connect by intercalated discs, 
These are specialized junctions found between cardiac muscle fibers that allow for cells to communicate directly with one another. Further, cardiac muscle tissue is found only in the heart, where it helps pump blood through the heart and to the lungs as well as to the rest of the body. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, simply meaning we don't have conscious control of the contraction and relaxation of this particular muscle tissue. Finally, we have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of our hollow organs, such as in the digestive system, the respiratory system, as well as the reproductive system. And unlike skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue, smooth muscle is non-striated because we don't see sarcomeres. There's a single nucleus per cell, and in terms of fiber shape, we don't see branching, we don't see long cylinders. Rather, the muscle fibers for smooth muscle are somewhat spindle-shaped, where they're fat in the middle and tapered at each end. Smooth muscle is under involuntary control, where it's generally described by having the ability to regulate the body's internal environment. Now we return back to our discussion from chapter four in week three, where muscle has seven major functions. First, muscle tissue provides for movement. Muscles help move our body via locomotion, while also aiding in the movement of substances throughout our body, such as moving food stuff along the digestive tract. Further, muscle tissue provides support to help us maintain our posture while resisting the pull of gravity. And with this in mind, we rely on various skeletal muscles without much conscious control to help us maintain an erect or a seated position. These muscles are in our trunk in association with our vertebrae, as well as in our legs and our shoulders. Muscles also help us prevent unwanted movements, holding articulating bones in place by placing tension on some tendons while not on others. Third, muscle tissue provides for protection. For instance, skeletal muscles of the torso protect the organs of the abdominal cavity, thereby serving protection. Next, muscle tissue provides for heat generation, and especially skeletal muscle tissue, which releases a considerable amount of heat during the process of contraction. Some studies show skeletal muscles produce up to 85% of our body heat. Muscle tissue also aids in blood circulation, where we can consider the cardiac muscle of the heart contracting to pump blood throughout the heart, as well as we can consider smooth muscles of our vessels that aid in movement of blood throughout the vessels of our body, thus more directly delivering oxygenated blood to all of our tissues. Point six, muscles provide us the ability to breathe. We rely on several skeletal muscles, including our diaphragm and other accessory skeletal muscles, to passively as well as actively inhale, as well as passively or forcibly exhale. Further, we rely on the smooth muscles of our respiratory tree to help us in moving air into and out of the lungs. And finally, muscles allow us to communicate. We rely on muscles to help us talk, to help us gesture, to convey our emotions by doing such things as smiling or frowning. Moving from the topic of muscle function, muscle tissue has five special properties or characteristics, if you will, that enable it to function and contribute to overall body homeostasis. First, muscle tissue has electrical excitability, sometimes referred to as responsiveness or irritability. This is a muscle's ability to respond to certain stimuli, either inside the body or outside the body. Next, muscle tissue has conductivity. This is a muscle's ability not just to receive a stimulus and become excited, but also transmit a wave of excitation over the rest of the muscle. Third, muscle tissue has contractility. This is the ability of muscle tissue to contract forcefully when stimulated by an action potential, resulting in muscle tissue pulling on its bony attachment points and shortening with force. And there are two types of muscle contraction. We have isometric contraction, where muscle tissue develops tension but actually doesn't shorten, and isotonic contraction, when the tension generated by a contraction is great enough to overcome the resistance of an object so as to move it. We're going to see muscle shortening and movement resulting. Next, muscle tissue has extensibility. This is the ability for muscles to stretch without being damaged. For instance, in order to flex the knee, so imagine flexing your knee, the extensor muscles, that is the muscles of the quadricep, the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, the vastus medialis, those muscles, those four muscles making up the quadriceps, must extend in order to allow for knee flexion to occur. Try that out and imagine how that works. 
Finally, muscle tissue has elasticity or the ability to recoil and return to its original length and shape after contraction or extension. To begin the study of muscles in earnest, let's go ahead and look at the four components or integrated tissues of skeletal muscle tissue. We see muscle fibers or muscle cells, we see blood, we see nervous tissue, and we see connective tissue. First, we have muscle fibers. Skeletal muscles are composed of hundreds to thousands of muscle cells called muscle fibers. And at the gross level, these fibers are long and cylindrical. If we're talking about skeletal muscles, they can be quite large with lengths up to around 11 inches if we are to consider the sartorius muscle of the anterior thigh. Next, we have blood vessels as a major component of skeletal muscle. And when you try to visualize the blood supply of skeletal muscles, what might you see? Well, imagine the work of the average skeletal muscle. Let's just say a muscle of the leg. It does a lot of work by supporting our daily movements. And with this in mind, it expends a lot of energy contracting. For it to contract and expend energy, it needs a steady delivery of oxygen, nutrients, while it also needs a system to remove metabolic wastes. And as you might guess, based on this information, we find that skeletal muscles have a rich blood supply. Next, Nerves are a major component of skeletal muscle tissue. And in fact, each and every muscle fiber, so each and every cell, muscle cell, in a skeletal muscle is supplied by an axon branch of a somatic motor neuron, which signals muscle fibers to contract. The structural point of contact, or what we might call the functional site of communication between a motor neuron and a muscle fiber, is called the neuromuscular junction. And we'll look at neuromuscular junctions in considerable detail later on in this lecture. Finally, skeletal muscles have connective tissue. Connective tissue surrounds and protects muscle tissue. And with this in mind, there's some general terminology and information I'd like to share about connective tissue in association with skeletal muscles. So let's go ahead and look at the various types of connective tissue associated with muscle. First, let's consider fascia. Fascia is a sheet or a broad band of fibrous connective tissue that supports and surrounds muscles and other organs of the body. And with this in mind, we actually have two types of fascia. We have superficial fascia and we have deep fascia. Superficial fascia separates muscle from skin and it's composed of areolar connective tissue. Remember, this is our areolar connective tissue example as well as adipose tissue. The adipose tissue stores most of the body's triglycerides. It serves as an insulating layer to reduce heat loss, to protect muscles from physical trauma. Generally, superficial fascia provides a pathway for nerves, for blood vessels, for lymphatic vessels to enter and exit our skeletal muscles. In contrast, we also have deep fascia, which lines the body wall and limbs and holds muscles with similar functions together. And it's composed of dense, irregular connective tissue, which we see an example from our PAL site here. And this dense irregular connective tissue is going to allow for the free movement of muscles carrying nerves, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, as well as fills the spaces between muscles. So these are two types of fascia. We consider connective tissue further by looking at what we call connective tissue sheaths that extend from the deep fascia to further protect and strengthen skeletal muscle. And we have three different types of sheaths, epimesium, paramesium, and endomesium. First, epimesium. This is the outermost layer, which encircles a whole muscle, and it's composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. So if this right here is our whole muscle, we're going to see the epimesium covering the entire muscle. Next, we have paramesium. This tissue surrounds groups of muscle fibers we call fascicles. And fascicles are generally described as bundles of 10 to 100, maybe even more, individual muscle fibers grouped together. Like epimesium, this tissue sheath is also composed of dense irregular connective tissue. So here, if we have our muscle and we pull out a group of muscle fibers that are all bundled together, this right here is our fascicle. And covering the fascicle, we have our paramecium as that dense irregular connective tissue covering. Finally, we have endomesium. Now, if we take a fascicle and we pull out one muscle fiber, so one muscle cell, we actually see some subunits here, so don't get confused. This right here is one muscle fiber. We have endomesium that's going to be the sheath wrapping around individual muscle fibers, and it's composed of areolar connective tissue. Now, as you look at all of this connective tissue, 
this slide as well as fascia from the last slide. The functions are pretty much straightforward. Connective tissue binds muscle fibers together, increasing the coordination of their activities. It adds strength to muscle. And as mentioned when talking about superficial and deep fascia, connective tissue helps provide a route of entry and exit for the vessels and nerves and lymphatics of muscle fibers. As we continue our study of the gross anatomy of muscle, we can consider how muscle is attached to bone. First, we look at the terms origin and insertion. These describe the attachment points a muscle makes with bone. The origin is described as a muscle's attachment point to an immovable or less movable bone. This is typically found proximal to the second point of attachment, which we call the insertion. And the insertion is defined as the attachment point to movable bone, whereby when a muscle contracts, the movable bone is going to move toward the immovable or less movable bone. Now, when muscles attach to bone, be it at the point of origin or the point of insertion, they may be attached in one of two ways. Muscle might be connected to bone by direct attachment, and this is certainly less common. But in this manner, with direct attachment, the epimesium of the muscle is fused to the periosteum of bone. More commonly, muscle attaches to bone by indirect attachment whereby the connective tissue wrappings of the muscle and the muscle fascicles and the muscle fibers are going to extend beyond the muscle to create a tendon or to create an aponeurosis, which either attaches directly to bone or indirectly to it via what we call the periosteum, that outer coating of bone. Generally, the epimesium, paramesium, and endomesium are all continuous with the connective tissue that attaches skeletal muscles to bony structures. And two important structures to know are tendons and aponeuroses. Tendons are the cords of dense regular connective tissue that attaches a muscle to the periosteum of bone or directly to bone. And in the case of this top image right here, what we're going to see is the calcaneal tendon of the gastrocnemius muscle, sometimes it's referred to as the Achilles tendon, is going to attach to the calcaneus bone of our foot. We also find aponeuroses in the body. And these are tendons shaped more broad and flat. In this image here, we have the abdominal aponeurosis covering the rectus abdominis muscle that's going to help us connect the external and internal obliques anteriorly here. We also have the epicranial aponeurosis at the top of the skull found between the frontal bones and the occipital bones, and it's going to help connect the two parts of the occipitofrontalis muscle, which is not a muscle on your muscle checklist, but it just helps to get an understanding of where these aponeuroses are found in the body. When we look at individual skeletal muscles, we find there are differences in fascicle orientation. Remember, fascicles are groups of muscle fibers between 10 and 100, maybe even more, and the way these are oriented help anatomists classify muscles into one of five different groups or categories. First, we have what are called fusiform-shaped muscles. When we consider the fusiform-shaped muscles, we're looking at a muscle like this. These are muscles that appear thick in the middle and taper here at this end and this end. And an example of the fusiform muscle is the biceps brachii muscle of the arm, as well as back here posteriorly, we would see the gastrocnemius of the lower leg. We also have parallel muscles. So we see a parallel muscle illustration here. These appear as long strap-like muscles of uniform width and parallelly organized fascicles. These muscles can generally span a great distance and can shorten more than other muscle types. An example of parallel muscles include the sartorius found here in the anterior thigh, as well as we see the rectus abdominis muscle here. We have convergent muscles, muscles that appear fan-shaped. We have an example here where they're seen broad at the point of origin and converging toward a narrow insertion point. Such muscles are generally strong because their fascicles exert tension on a relatively small insertion point. And an example of a convergent muscle is the pectoralis major muscle, which we find here in the anterior chest. Next, we have pennate muscles. We have three different types. They're feather-shaped muscles, where their fascicles are going to insert obliquely on a tendon that runs the length of the muscle, similar to the shaft of a feather. And so here 
This is an example of a bipennate. We actually see unipennate, bipennate, and multipennate muscles. When we look at the tendon, we're seeing the tendon run here, the tendon run here, and we would see multiple tendons running this way. And then those fibers are going to run obliquely to connect to that tendon. So first of all, we have unipennate muscles, which we see an example here. And that's where we're going to see all fascicles approach the tendon from one side, which see that stacked here. An example of a unipennate muscle is the semimembranous muscle of the posterior thigh. And we don't actually see that here, but if we saw the posterior aspect of this body, we would see the thigh region, we would see that semimembranous muscle. We have the bipennate muscles, where fascicles approach the tendon from both sides, here as well as here. And an example of the bipennate muscle is our rectus femoris muscle, the anterior thigh, helping contribute to our quadricep muscles. Finally, we have what are called multipennate muscles, whereby a muscle appears to be shaped like a bunch of feathers with their quills converging onto a single point. And the deltoid muscle of the lateral shoulder we see here, we see three parts of the deltoid actually, anterior, medial, and posterior. And this is an example of our multipennate muscle. Now we move away from the pennate muscles with our last type of muscle, the circular muscle. Sometimes these are known as sphincters, and these muscles are, are a common arrangement found associated with body openings where the fascicles are arranged in concentric circles, as we might see right here. Now, I don't have any of these muscles on your muscle checklist to learn at this time. We will look at these muscles later on in the school year. We have the abicularis oris, the muscle associated with our mouth and lips as well as the abicularis oculi, the muscle located in the eyelids of the upper and lower eye, whose main function it is to close the eyelids. Naming muscles is a key concept, an aspect of the study of gross anatomy. And in fact, we can skip briefly to chapter 10 here to look at the seven common ways by which muscles can be named. First, muscles may be named by size such as using the terms vastus, maximus, minimus, longus, and brevis. Those are all size-based muscle terminology. Next, muscles may be named by shape. Many muscles have geometrical shape and are referenced as trapezius, deltoid, teres, and rhomboid, amongst others. Further, muscles may be named by their location. And some examples might include the temporalis and the occipitalis muscles, as well as the tibialis. Other muscles may be named by the number of heads they have or origins they have. And examples include the biceps, the triceps, and the quadriceps muscles. Fifth, muscles may be named by muscle orientation or the direction by which muscle fibers are running. Examples include rectus, which means straight or transverse, meaning across or oblique, meaning diagonal, or obicularis, meaning circular. Muscles can be named based on their origin or insertion point. In this way, there are no real hard or fast rules, but in general, we see this with some regularity within the neck muscles, including the sternocleidomastoid, where we have an origin on the sternum and the clavicle and an insertion point on the mastoid process. We have the sternohyoid, the sternothyroid, the thyrohyoid. These are all examples. Moving away from the neck region, we see something called the brachioradialis muscle, which is named based on the origin and insertion with the origin of the brachium or the arm and insertion on the radius. And finally, muscles may be named according to their action. Examples include extensors, flexors, adductors, abductors, supinators, maybe even pronators. Now that we've covered the major topics of gross anatomy of our muscle fibers, let's take a look at the microscopic anatomy of these muscle fibers. First, just a little background. During embryonic development, skeletal muscle fibers arise from the fusion of hundreds of mesodermal cells that we call myoblasts. And it's for this reason skeletal muscle fibers have hundreds of nuclei. Additionally, once fusion of these myoblasts occur, muscle fibers generally lose their ability to undergo mitosis. As a result, the number of skeletal muscle fibers is established even before birth. Muscle fibers can increase in size, but only under very unique and specific circumstances or situations might we actually see muscle fiber regeneration. Now let's go beyond a muscle and the muscle fascicle to look at individual muscle fibers 
discussing some important terminology in our understanding of microscopic anatomy. We see an illustration of a muscle fiber here, and covering that muscle fiber, we can identify the sarcolemma, and this is just a special name for the plasma membrane of muscle fibers. So we have the term sarcolemma, which is we see this covering here. Held within the sarcolemma, we have what's called the sarcoplasm. This is just a fancy name for the cytoplasm of a muscle cell, which is similar to the cytoplasm of other cells in our body that hold cell organelles. And some of the things that our sarcoplasm holds includes myoglobin, which is a red colored protein found only in muscle cells, which binds oxygen molecules and tell the mitochondria of these fibers need them for ATP production. We have glycosomes within the sarcoplasm. These are granules of stored glycogen. Remember from our brief discussion about carbohydrates way back at the beginning of the term, glycogen is the primary storage form of glucose. And so that'll provide muscles a rapid and easily accessible form of energy to supply muscle tissue demand. And finally, we have mitochondria. Skeletal muscles have an abundant supply of mitochondria, vital for supplying chemical energy in the form of ATP within this contractile system of our muscle fibers. Another key component of muscle fibers is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is a fluid-filled, membranous sac-like system wrapped around some organelles within a muscle fiber that aid in muscle contraction. And this is a general example here of our sarcoplasmic reticulum. If we see this in blue here, we don't actually see it here, but if we take one of these little structures out, which we'll talk about in a few moments, we see the sarcoplasmic reticulum wrapped around each of these little cylinders within a muscle fiber. Closely associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we see our sarcoplasmic reticulum here in blue, we will see what are called transverse tubules, sometimes referred to as T-tubules. These are tiny little invaginations of the sarcolemma, and this is going to help increase surface area of the sarcolemma. We see the sarcolemma here in an invagination. This suddenly increases surface area substantially, and we'll see why this is important coming up. Finally, as we consider the sarcoplasm of each muscle fiber, we see the sarcoplasm is packed with these rod-like myofibrils, which are made up of chains of connected sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are the structural and functional unit of a muscle fiber. And this contributes to our very prominent striations or repeating series of dark and light bands of a skeletal muscle fiber. Let's go ahead and we're gonna take a closer look at this. Recall in structural hierarchy, we've taken a muscle, we've pulled out a fascicle, we've pulled out a muscle fiber, and now we've pulled out a myofibril from an individual muscle fiber. So we've done that right here. So this is our muscle fiber, one cell, we've pulled out a myofibril within this one cell. Myofibrils are densely packed, rod-like elements found within muscle fibers with an individual muscle fiber containing thousands of myofibrils, making up the majority of the volume within the muscle fiber. Within each myofibril, we see what are called myofilaments, specifically two protein contractile filaments called actin, or sometimes referred to as thin filaments, and myosin, sometimes referred to as thick filaments. What I'd like to do now is zoom in on just a segment of an individual myofibril that we call the sarcomere. And so now we've taken a myofibril and we've just zoomed in on part of it. And this structure from here to here, from these blue lines vertically to these blue lines vertically, we see one sarcomere. So individual myofibrils are arranged in shorter compartments we call sarcomeres. And first things first, you should recognize the sarcomere is considered, again, basic functional and structural unit of muscle. And with this in mind, we're thinking actin and myosin, which we see running parallel with the myofibril. We see our thick filaments of myosin found in red running parallel to the myofibril. And then we're going to see our thin actin filaments found in blue. Note we have some overlapping areas between our myosin and actin, and that'll become important in a little bit. We also have a region here right in the middle by which we only see myosin, but we don't see any actin. And we'll see why that's critical in a few moments. Now let's go ahead and define some things within the sarcomere. First, a sarcomere is defined on each side by what we call Z-discs. So we see Z-discs running this way. Sometimes they're called Z-lines. We see another one here. So if I were to ask you about a sarcomere, you would say one sarcomere runs from Z-disc to the next Z-disc. 
And these Z-discs are plate-shaped regions of dense protein material that are used to separate sarcomeres from one to another. But they also provide for some attachment points, and we'll cover that in a moment. Next in our sarcomere, we see the H zone. So we see this region here, by which we're going to see this line, this red line moving down. I'll talk about that in a moment. The H zone is from the tip of actin to the tip of actin, so we don't actually see actin within the H zone. The H zone provides an attachment point. We actually have right in the middle of that H zone, we have something called the M line, which holds the thick filaments together, so these myosin filaments together, with the help of a structural protein we call myomycin. Visually, when we see contraction, we also have a darker middle part of the sarcomere called the A-band, which spans from the outer tip or the lateral tip of one myosin all the way to its other side. So this is our A-band. And then finally, we have I-bands. I-bands are going to be lighter, less dense areas of the sarcomere that contain only part of the thin actin filament from one sarcomere as well as a thin actin filament from another sarcomere. The I-band does not contain thick myosin filaments. We've already considered the sarcoplasmic reticulum a bit ago, but I want to elaborate a little further now. Recall I said earlier, the SR, or sarcoplasmic reticulum, includes fluid-filled membranous sacs wrapped around individual myofibrils that aid in muscle contraction. And in fact, that's exactly what this image is going to show. So we have one muscle fiber here by which we see myofilaments running parallel. And each myofilament is going to have sarcoplasmic reticulum wrapped around it. And in terms of how they're positioned in their wrappings, there's a very specific way by which the sarcoplasmic reticulum is organized. The Z discs of sarcomeres will be found here as well as here, and the sacs extending from each Z disc are going to meet in the middle. So if we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum running this direction and running this direction, they are going to meet in the middle here at the H zone, where we see myosin and actin overlapping, and then we only see myosin here at the H zone. Now, functionally, the sarcoplasmic reticulum helps regulate intracellular calcium levels within the myofibril, and we'll see why that's important shortly. Meanwhile, how can calcium ions be controlled within the myofibril? Well, this is where the terminal cisterns, or cisternae, come in. Our terminal cisterns are found at the very end of each side of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here, as well as here, we see terminal cisterns. Simply put, these are storage bags for calcium found near the junction between the A-band and the I-band that send out calcium to the sarcoplasmic reticulum under certain conditions. We see the terminal cisterns in blue here right next to this yellow structure as well as here right next to this yellow structure. What I want to do next is talk about these yellow structures, something we call transverse tubules. Transverse tubules are tubules formed by the invagination of the sarcolemma. And rather than rely on the image from the last slide, which we see here, we saw those terminal cisterns in yellow, I want to use this illustration here. Ultimately, if we see the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber running, we're going to see that invagination creating the transverse tubules. When the time comes and we need to send an electrical signal along the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, it not only travels along the fiber here, but also it runs deep down within the muscle fiber to connect with all of the myofibrils within that muscle fiber. And when an electrical signal runs down our transverse tubule, what we're going to find is it's going to interact with some proteins within this terminal cistern that are going to trigger the release of calcium to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So action potential or electrical signal moving along the sarcolemma down transverse tubules triggers a reaction by which calcium stored here in the terminal cisterns is released to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. From there, calcium ions are going to be released out into the myofibril by which they can interact with components of the sarcomere. Now there's another term introduced here called the triad. The triad is simply a region formed by two terminal cisterns, one here, one here, as well as with a transverse tubule found in the middle. Let's take a step back now to consider the various proteins found in a skeletal muscle fiber. Ultimately, 
the proteins of the sarcomere can be lumped together into three broad categories as contractile proteins, regulatory proteins, or structural proteins. As we consider contractile proteins, contractile proteins are the proteins responsible for generating force during muscle contraction. With this in mind, we have actin and myosin. In this particular image, actin, or the thin contractile filament, is found here running horizontally in blue, with myosin, or our thick contractile filaments, found in brown with these little golf club-like structures projecting off the myosin filament. In generating a force during contraction, actin and myosin are going to connect together. That is, this little golf club-like structure is going to bind to a myosin binding site on actin and facilitate contraction by sliding past one another. So we will see actin is going to move in this direction. Our myosin, these heads, are going to help pull actin toward our end line. What I want to do is take a look at this in a bit closer detail using an image from the textbook. Here we have myosin in red with our golf club-like heads, and we have actin in blue. We see myosin is going to connect to the M line medially with the help of myomesin, and it's going to be found in the middle of the sarcomere. We're going to see elastic filaments in yellow by which we hold our myosin to the Z disc. Myosin functions by pulling its cargo, that is actin, and to achieve movement, it converts chemical energy, we need ATP, into mechanical energy, the form of motion. And we see this near the end of our lecture today. Now, I alluded in the last slide to the fact that myosin molecules have little golf club-like structures on them. We see these here, we see them here. More formally, they're called myosin heads. And they're going to project outward from myosin at the shaft in a spiraling fashion, extending toward one of the thin filaments that surrounds each of the thick filaments. So we might see these myosin heads interact with the actin here, myosin heads interact with the actin here, as well as the actin here and the strand of actin right here. We also have actin, so our thin filaments are found in blue here, and you see actin extending from our Z disc, spanning across the I band and partway into the A band such that actin and myosin overlap, allowing for eventual connectivity. Moving from our contractile proteins, we also have what are called regulatory proteins. We have tropomyosin and troponin, which are associated with actin and are responsible for turning on or off the process of muscle contraction. Let's go ahead and look at our next slide to see how this interaction between these two regulatory proteins unfold. As regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin, together with calcium ions, can control the process of muscle contraction or regulate the process of muscle contraction. First, we're going to have tropomyosin, which we see here in green, wrapped around our actin. And they have the responsibility of blocking the myosin binding sites on actin. When myosin head binding sites are blocked, myosin can't bind to actin. And in this situation, a muscle is in the relaxed state. However, we have another regulatory protein called troponin, which we see in blue, little subunits here, blue, 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 associated with each of our tropomyosin strands. And these are going to be responsible for binding calcium. So when calcium floods out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we're going to see that calcium bind to troponin, and in turn, it's going to change the position of tropomyosin associated with these actin filaments. We're going to see tropomyosin move away from the myosin binding sites on actin, thereby allowing myosin, those myosin heads, to bind to actin and create a cross bridge. And so we see this here. We see that golf club-like head, the myosin head, bind to the binding sites, the myosin binding sites on actin, because we have changed the position of tropomyosin due to the fact that calcium has been bound to troponin. The creation of this cross bridge is ultimately going to trigger muscle contraction, and we'll talk about this later on in lecture as well. Lastly, we look at structural proteins associated with muscle, of which I've listed six different structural proteins here. Structural proteins help keep actin and myosin in proper alignment within the sarcomere, providing for elasticity and extensibility in addition to maintaining alignment. 
Our first structural protein is CAPZ. CAPZ, found here in red, helps attach actin to our Z disc or Z line. Next, we have a protein called tropomodulin. Tropomodulin here in green is going to act as an end stop for actin to ensure that actin maintains its structure and doesn't unravel. We also have nebulin. Nebulin will be found here in strands of tan and it's going to wrap around actin to help further secure actin and keep it aligned parallel to the sarcomere. Now we also have a protein called dystrophin and we don't actually see dystrophin in this particular illustration. However, dystrophin is going to be responsible for connecting actin to the sarcolemma, further helping aid in alignment. Our next two proteins, or I should say our last two proteins, have more to do with myosin. First we have myomycin, which I've mentioned already. Myomycin is found at the M line by which myosin will be bound to the M line. So we see that alignment or positioning of myosin due to myomycin, and it's found here in peach. Finally, we have titan. In this image, titan is found in purple. We see myosin here with this purple strand. This is our titan. It's going to help connect myosin to the Z disc while also connecting myosin further to the M line. So these are our three types of proteins found within skeletal muscle, of which we have a category of contractile proteins, regulatory proteins, and structural proteins. Now that we've considered microscopic anatomy of the muscle fiber and looked at the various proteins associated with individual sarcomeres, I'd like to switch gears to talk about how a muscle contracts. And in doing so, I want to discuss contraction very generally with this slide. First, contraction is the process of creating cross bridges, that is joining actin and myosin heads together to generate force. This occurs when calcium levels within the sarcomere are high, resulting in calcium binding with troponin, moving tropomyosin out of the myosin binding sites on actin to permit myosin to bind with actin, creating that cross bridge. And then with force, we see shortening of sarcomeres occurring as myosin pulls actin toward the M line. And in doing so, our Z discs are going to come closer and closer together. Finally, contraction ends when cross bridges become inactive, which when you consider what's happening at the microscopic level, this is when calcium levels are low and we don't see calcium binding with troponin. I want to talk about the sliding filament model of contraction, but in doing so, I want to share a little history and context as we look at this model of contraction. If we go back about 70 years ago, in May of 1954, there were two teams of researchers, one of which was from the University of Cambridge, another was from MIT. And independently, these two teams of researchers published two very groundbreaking papers, which they described the molecular basis of muscle contraction. Their research described the position of myosin and actin filaments at various stages of contraction in muscle fibers, and with this, they proposed how the interaction between these two contractile proteins produced force or contractile force. While not immediately accepted in the science community, it ultimately replaced an earlier theory of muscle contraction, where it was believed that muscles contracted in more of an accordion-like folding process. In 1987 and then in 2001, additional findings helped add to this sliding filament model of contraction, specifically regarding myosin head interactions, so those heads, those golf club-like heads, and how they interacted with the binding sites on actin. And I imagine as time goes by, as is common with other fields of science, more research and more findings will help feather out or ferret out additional aspects of this sliding filament mechanism, this model of contraction that scientists and anatomists recognize today. So this is how the idea of the sliding filament model came to be. Ultimately, the sliding filament model of contraction states that during contraction, actin filaments slide past myosin, causing actin and myosin to overlap more and more. In this manner, neither actin nor myosin filaments change themselves, but rather, actin just changes position. That is, actin is moved closer to the M line with the help of those myosin heads. So this is our sliding filament model of contraction. And we see that taking place here in illustration as well as 
in image. So we see our myosin filaments. In the presence of calcium, we would see them bind with the myosin binding sites of actin and gradually pull actin in this direction, pull this strand of actin in this direction, thus grabbing and pulling on the Z-discs and bringing these Z-discs closer and closer to the M-line as actin approaches the M-line. And here we would see shortening by which actin is going to be at the midline. So we see our Z-discs here and here, but with contraction, we see that change in position by which they're found here and here. Now, what occurs during contraction? As I mentioned, we're going to see our Z-discs are going to be pulled toward the M-line because actin is attached to them and actin is pulled toward the midline. In turn, the distance between the Z-discs are going to shorten. Our I bands are going to shorten, and finally the H zone is going to disappear because actin is brought toward the M line. So these are a variety of things we see under the microscope during contraction. We now consider muscle contraction in yet more detail. First, recall skeletal muscle contraction is voluntary. We think consciously about moving a body part, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture. And in doing so, we send an electrical signal in the form of an action potential from the brain along our somatic motor neuron, ultimately activating a muscle fiber or a group of fibers to trigger skeletal muscle contraction. And looking at this image here, we would see an action potential traveling along the axon of this motor neuron by which we come to these terminal axons and at the terminal axon, we see something called the neuromuscular junction. Sometimes it's called the motor end plate. This is the area by which motor neuron communicates with the muscle fiber. However, we don't actually see the motor neuron or that terminal axon of the motor neuron touching the sarcolemma, the muscle fiber. In fact, there's a little gap that we call the synaptic cleft by which we need to rely on a neurotransmitter, in this case, acetylcholine, to transfer that electrical signal, that electrical impulse, that action potential from the motor neuron to the sarcolemma itself. Let's go ahead and take a look at the neuromuscular junction in a little more detail. Now, referring to this image taken from the textbook, we see the axon of our somatic motor neuron found here with our terminal end of the axon defined as this bulb-like structure found here. Further, we're going to see a skeletal muscle fiber here and the space between the axon terminal and the skeletal muscle fiber is called the synaptic cleft. Recall earlier in lecture, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma, so we see the sarcolemma here. And at the site of the neuromuscular junction, the sarcolemma is going to fold up and create what we call junctional folds. Junctional folds increase surface area of the sarcolemma facing the synaptic cleft. And here we're going to see these little structures here called acetylcholine receptors. They're going to stud or pierce the sarcolemma facing the synaptic cleft and bind acetylcholine upon a release of acetylcholine from these structures here called synaptic vesicles or just vesicles. In addition, these acetylcholine receptors are going to be associated with sodium channels, which will come into play in a little bit. So to sum up this slide, as we look at the neuromuscular junction, if asked, our neuromuscular junction is composed of three parts. We have the axon terminal of the motor neuron, which we see here. We see a synaptic cleft, this region here, this gap or space between our axon terminal of our motor neuron and the junctional folds of the sarcolemma. So we see sarcolemma, synaptic cleft, and terminal axon or axon terminal. These are the three parts making up the neuromuscular junction. I'd like to go ahead now and draw out a motor neuron and the rest of the neuromuscular junction. My in-person class practices this on a handful of occasions throughout our three-week unit, and I'd like you to practice as well. As we draw out the neuromuscular junction, we'll be sure to include the following components seen here at left. And so let's go ahead and we'll first draw out our somatic motor neuron. 
We also have a muscle fiber running along with our junctional folds. So we see that sarcolemma here. And the motor neuron isn't going to come in direct contact with the muscle fiber. Remember, we have a gap here called our synaptic cleft. So we have motor neuron, we have the sarcolemma, and this is our muscle fiber itself. Here we have our junctional folds. Now we also have some vesicles at the terminal end of our axon, so I'm going to put some vesicles in, and they're going to be filled with acetylcholine. Let's go ahead now and add our channels, by which we're going to see calcium channels found here. So we're going to see calcium channels. We will also see acetylcholine receptors. And further on of our sarcolemma, we're going to have channels for both sodium and potassium. As it pertains to these various channels, we're going to see as an action potential travels along the motor neuron, once we see that action potential, which I'll abbreviate AP, past these calcium channels, we will see calcium flood in. And as calcium floods in, it will interact with these vesicles, by which those vesicles are then going to fuse with the membrane and release acetylcholine out into the synaptic cleft. Once acetylcholine, ACH, binds with these receptors, this will open up sodium channels and sodium will flood in. Now, in addition to that, we're going to see these receptors here, these voltage-gated receptors, by which once sodium floods in here, it will trigger the opening of sodium channels here and here, creating more flood of sodium into the cell. But do take note that these sodium channels are different than these. Let's go ahead and review one last time what happens with the arrival of an action potential. So we have an electrical signal. That electrical signal, once it passes, these calcium channels will result in the flowing in of calcium. So we have what are called voltage-gated channels for calcium to flood in. That calcium is going to bind to those terminal vesicles that are holding acetylcholine. And once they interact together, calcium with these vesicles, we will see the migration of those vesicles right to the end of this membrane by which acetylcholine is going to be released out to the synaptic cleft via exocytosis. Acetylcholine is then going to bind with these green receptors here. And once acetylcholine as a chemical message binds with these acetylcholine receptors, that will open sodium channels. Sodium is going to flood in. We're going to see a very strong positive environment near this neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. That is ultimately going to trigger these sodium channels to open by which we will see more flooding in of sodium. Now we'll talk about potassium in a slide coming up, but this is our neuromuscular junction. And if you were in class in person, we would draw these out on a couple of occasions such that you'd be familiar with them in order to draw this on your lecture exam. I wanna pause for a moment to introduce some new terminology. The terms resting membrane potential, end plate potential, and action potential. The resting membrane potential is a cell membrane at rest, and in this case, we're considering the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. This potential results from an uneven distribution of ions. Specifically, we're looking at potassium ions and sodium ions across the sarcolemma, so outside versus inside this muscle fiber, with potassium ions found inside the cell and more sodium ions found outside the cell, but not in equal concentrations. In fact, there's more sodium ions outside the cell as compared to potassium ions inside the cell. Thus, there's a relative positive charge outside the cell as compared to inside. So we say the inside of the muscle fiber is more negatively charged than that of the outside of the cell. Now saying all this, the resting membrane potential can be defined as the electrical potential difference across the sarcolemma when the muscle fiber is in the resting or non-excited state. We also have what's called an end plate potential, which begins with an action potential arriving via the motor neuron at the site of the neuromuscular junction. We must take an electrical signal 
from the motor neuron, convert it to a chemical signal with the help of acetylcholine, and transform it back into an electrical signal on the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber to send an action potential along the sarcolemma. Now, as acetylcholine binds to receptors of the sarcolemma, we're going to see an influx of sodium ions into the muscle fiber, thus changing the distribution of charge across the sarcolemma, so from outside to in. And specifically, as sodium flows in, we see an influx of positive charge, thus making the interior of this muscle fiber less negative or more positive. And in doing so, we're going to see a little wave of depolarization, which spreads to adjacent sarcolemma right nearby the neuromuscular junction or that motor end plate in all directions. And this is the end plate potential. So we have just a little wave of depolarization. Once this uneven distribution of ions is sufficiently large enough, that is, we're going to meet threshold, and that's a term you're going to see in your physio -X activities, it leads to the initiation of the action potential itself, so the electrical stimulation of an entire muscle fiber. And in this manner, special sodium channels along the sarcolemma open up to allow even more sodium to flow in. So we have those voltage-gated sodium channels that I showed you in that drawing just a few moments ago. And that's going to allow the action potential to continue or to propagate along the sarcolemma and excite the entire muscle fiber. Later, we're going to see potassium channels along the sarcolemma as well. So those voltage-gated potassium channels I drew out but didn't explain, that's going to help us in bringing our muscle fiber back to resting membrane potential after an action potential passes. But in this case, this slide, we have three terms with regards to membrane potential. We have resting membrane potential, end plate potential, and the action potential itself. Let's go ahead and look at the channels we've just discussed. So we have those calcium channels, we have sodium channels associated with acetylcholine receptors at the junctional folds, as well as we have both sodium and potassium channels found along the sarcolemma, other than at the junctional folds. Specifically, I want to talk about chemically gated ion channels, as well as voltage gated ion channels. So chemically gated ion channels, these are channels that open as a result of a chemical messenger. So what chemical messenger, what chemical messenger have we seen? Well, recall acetylcholine is responsible for being exocytized at the synaptic cleft, diffusing across the cleft, binding to acetylcholine receptors of those junctional folds. That's a chemical that's going to be responsible for being a chemical messenger. So at those particular channels, they are considered chemically gated ion channels. We need acetylcholine to open up those sodium channels. But in contrast, we also have voltage gated ion channels. First, we have voltage gated ion channels within the motor neuron, where when that action potential passes down to the terminal end, it passes calcium channels. And when the action potential passes, calcium channels open up, permitting a flood of calcium ions into the terminal axon of the motor neurons so they can interact with those vesicles. Those are voltage-gated channels. Further, we have voltage-gated sodium channels along the sarcolemma, which open up in response to the end plate potential, allowing for a flood of sodium into the muscle fiber, facilitating the action potential along the sarcolemma. Again, those are going to open in response to developing an end plate potential. So those are also considered voltage-gated ion channels. Keep in mind, again, two types of channels, one that opens a channel due to binding with a chemical messenger, and the other that opens a channel due to a change in the membrane potential. The rest of this lecture is going to be dedicated to the four steps which must occur for skeletal muscle contraction to occur. So we're moving along to what steps must occur for skeletal muscle contraction to take place. Specifically, our textbook separates these processes of muscle contraction into four individual steps, which we see visually here. And although these are listed as steps, keep in mind the various happenings in the muscle fiber. These are all somewhat interconnected, overlapping, or otherwise dependent upon other parts First, we have events that transpire at the neuromuscular junction. This was the topic of our last few slides. 
Next, we have muscle fiber excitation, for which we just briefly described with the development of an end plate potential leading to an action potential. We also have excitation contraction coupling, where we see calcium ions dumped out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum so they can interact with troponin, thus aiding and opening up those myosin binding sites on actin so the myosin heads can bind. So that's that idea of coupling. And finally, we have what's called cross bridge cycling, the actual process by which myosin heads move actin closer to the M line, thus shortening sarcomeres and facilitating muscle contraction itself. So we'll go through these four steps, but again, keep in mind that they're all interconnected or otherwise overlapping or even describing the same events during different highlighted steps here. In our first step, the events that occur at the neuromuscular junction, this I feel you should have down pretty clear. First, an action potential is going to arrive at the axon terminal of a motor neuron. Then we see voltage-gated calcium channels open, allowing calcium to enter the motor neuron. From there, calcium ions interact with the synaptic vesicles filled with acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, and we see vesicles move or be sent to the terminal end to bind with the plasma membrane of the neuron. We call that the neurolemma. We'll see that next term. And we release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft via a process called exocytosis. Further, acetylcholine is going to then diffuse across the synaptic cleft to interact with acetylcholine receptors found at the junctional folds of the sarcolemma. Then we see binding of acetylcholine to the respective receptors, opening up sodium channels, allowing sodium to enter the muscle fiber and trigger end plate potential. Lastly, and again, we're just talking about what's happening at the neuromuscular junction, so we're not focused on the sarcolemma at this point of the muscle fiber. So in terms of the neuromuscular junction, our last step, we need to end the signaling process. To do so, we need to get rid of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. This may be done by using an enzyme we call acetylcholine esterase, which recycles the components of acetylcholine. So we're gonna break acetylcholine down into acetic acid, into choline, and we're going to reuse or recycle those. Or acetylcholine can be removed simply by diffusing away from the synaptic cleft. This slide provides a visual of those six steps of events that take place at the neuromuscular junction. I'll leave you to look through these. These are also associated with a one-page illustration taken from our textbook. At this point, we move along to step two required for skeletal muscle contraction to occur. That is the idea of muscle fiber excitation. And in considering this step, we're going to refer to this graph here as we look at the three steps. We're going to see generation of an end plate potential, which we find through here, we're going to see depolarization, which we're going to see in this great spike upward, and then repolarization, which we find here as the spike drops back down toward this negative 90 millivolts. First, we generate an end plate potential. To do this, recall we start with a muscle fiber arresting membrane potential and with an influx of sodium here as a result of binding of acetylcholine, sodium is going to diffuse through into the muscle fiber, changing that distribution of charge across the sarcolemma. In fact, as we see an influx of sodium, we're seeing an influx of positive charge, making the interior of this muscle fiber less negative or more positive, and in doing so, this small wave of depolarization is going to spread out to the adjacent sarcolemma in all different directions. So we have a small spread of a more positive charge, yet we don't have depolarization proper, but rather we just have localized depolarization, and we call this the end plate potential. Next, the process of depolarization unfolds. If the end plate potential causes enough change in charge across the sarcolemma to meet thresholds, voltage-gated sodium channels that are going to be found along the sarcolemma are going to open up, resulting in a large influx of sodium ions into the muscle fiber, triggering an action potential, which ultimately leads to muscle contraction. And we're not going to look at this potassium channel yet. Following an action potential and muscle contraction, we need to restore resting membrane conditions of the muscle fiber to ensure muscle relaxation. And to do this, we go through a two-step process we call repolarization. 
In the first step of repolarization, our voltage-gated sodium channels on the sarcolemma need to close. So we've seen those voltage-gated sodium channels during depolarization open up, we see sodium flood in, now we need to close those down, preventing more influx of sodium ions. In turn, now we're going to see our voltage-gated potassium channels on the sarcolemma open up allowing for an efflux of potassium out of the cell. So now we're going to be left with sodium inside the cell and potassium outside of the cell. And that's going to help us restore our electrical conditions. That is, we're going to see a lot of positive charge outside the muscle fiber in contrast to a lesser positive charge or more negative charge inside the muscle fiber. However, we do need to go through a second step of repolarization. We need to restore our ionic concentrations to the resting state across the plasma membrane or that sarcolemma. And to do this, we need to rely on what are called sodium potassium ATPase pumps, whereby we can pump three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions we pump into the cell. And these pumps are called ATPase pumps because they are ATP dependent. We need to move our sodium and potassium in order to restore ionic concentrations. So I want to emphasize repolarization is a two-part process. We need to restore the electrical conditions first by which we see a more positive charge on the outside and compared to negative on the inside of the muscle fiber, but then we also need to follow that up with restoring our ionic concentrations, ensuring there's a lot of sodium outside of the cell and our potassium is found inside of the cell. And so to recap this visually, this graph right here that I showed you a few moments ago, this graph shows the process of muscle contraction. If we follow this curve here along this graph, we're going to see end plate potential depolarization and repolarization. So first of all, on the x-axis, we see time in milliseconds, and we're going to see membrane potential in millivolts on our y-axis. So first here at resting membrane potential, we see, we measure this at about negative 90 millivolts. And that simply means there's more positive charge outside the cell as compared to inside the cell to the tune of a difference of about negative 90 millivolts. Now as an action potential arrives via our motor neuron to the neuromuscular junction, we ultimately see the generation of an end plate potential here. So we're going to see that small rise in the line here. With enough sodium flowing through our channels associated with acetylcholine at those junctional folds to bring membrane potential to around negative 70 millivolts. And once a muscle fiber reaches this point, maybe around negative 70 or so, this is termed threshold. The muscle fiber is committed at this point to depolarization. In this manner, voltage gated sodium channels along the sarcolemma open up allowing for a major flood of positively charged sodium ions into the muscle fiber. And so we see this sharp spike here until we reach a membrane potential of roughly positive 30 millivolts. So we go from about negative 90 up to positive 30 with depolarization. And at this point, the action potential passes and the muscle fiber now needs to return back to its resting membrane potential. This is done with the help of voltage-gated potassium channels. So we're going to close our sodium channels, those voltage-gated sodium channels, our voltage-gated potassium channels are going to open. We are then going to see an efflux of potassium ions out of the cell by which we are going to repolarize due to potassium exit. And gradually we will get back to that negative 90 millivolts at which point our potassium channels have closed. We have repolarized in two steps. We've moved ions and through this region here, we're also relying on those sodium potassium ATPase pumps to ensure that our ions are found on the appropriate sides. So recall, repolarization here, this two-part process, electrical conditions are going to unfold following that with ionic concentrations are going to be restored. We leave the action potential graph to consider the third step of muscle contraction, that of excitation contraction coupling. And this coupling process involves the events that transpire following an action potential propagating along the sarcolemma. We need to look at microscopic anatomy of the muscle to consider four steps. And in our first step here, we're going to see the action potential propagating along the sarcolemma 
down into those transverse tubules. It causes a release of calcium via those terminal cisterns into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, flooding a muscle fiber with calcium. Remember the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium ions at its terminal cisterns. And this is key. This is a key step in muscle contraction because we need calcium ions. And do you remember why we need calcium ions? It's because as calcium floods in, it binds with troponin, it modifies tropomyosin, such that tropomyosin is no longer able to block those myosin binding sites on actin. And now myosin-actin heads can bind with actin to create a cross bridge that's needed for muscle contraction. And so this concludes the excitation contraction coupling stage of muscle contraction. Our textbook provides this illustration here to show the visual of excitation contraction coupling. In this slide, I want to just remind you or emphasize how calcium plays a role in muscle contraction. At low intracellular calcium concentration levels, recall tropomyosin blocks active sites on actin, preventing myosin heads from attaching actin to create cross bridges. But at high intracellular calcium concentration levels, Calcium can bind to troponin, it modifies tropomyosin, it opens up the active sites on actin, and we see binding of myosin heads to actin in order to promote cross bridge formation. The last step of muscle contraction is the cross bridge cycle itself. Cross bridge cycling has four steps as follows. We have cross bridge formation first, so myosin heads bind to actin to form cross bridges. This occurs at the very end of excitation contraction coupling. And in this manner, the energized myosin heads attach to the myosin binding sites on actin, releasing hydrolyzed phosphate groups. So part of the ATP molecule, we take phosphate off and we throw it out. And this gives us energy. Next, we have what's called the working stroke or the power stroke. In this manner, the release of our phosphate, our inorganic phosphate and that ADP triggers the power stroke of contraction. And during the power stroke, myosin heads pivot and bend, pulling actin filaments closer toward the M line. Third, we have detachment of myosin heads from actin. At the end of the power stroke, myosin heads remain firmly attached to actin until they bind with a new molecule of ATP. So we need ATP here. With ATP binding, the myosin head detaches from actin. And so that's step three, cross bridge detachment, which requires ATP. Finally, we have ATP hydrolysis and the caulking of the myosin head anew. So in this manner, we must energize myosin heads with the binding of ATP to the myosin heads. But then as that ATP is hydrolyzed in this step from binding in the last step, the reaction energizes the myosin head, or rather it prepares for another cross bridge formation to repeat this cycle. And I wanna point out here, this four step process is a cycle. It's a series of events which occurs in rapid succession and it repeats. We don't have a starting or stopping point, but rather it's simply a cycle. Our textbook provides an illustration of our cross bridge cycling, which we see here. So we see the formation of a cross bridge. We're going to see that power stroke or working stroke. Then we see cross bridge detachment followed by caulking of the myosin head to prepare for new cross bridge formation. Now in our last slide of this lecture, we take a step away from the textbook in one respect. This particular slide gives you the things I want you to know as you complete your Physio X activities for this week and next week. Specifically, you should walk away with an understanding of a muscle twitch, including the three parts of the myogram. We have the latent period, the contraction period, and the relaxation period. Further, you should understand graded muscle response based on either a change in the frequency of a stimulus or a change in the strength of the stimulus. You should also understand the two major types of muscle contractions, isotonic and isometric. And in terms of isotonic, you should know that we have two types, concentric and eccentric. Lastly, as you complete your physio -ex activities this week, next week, you should know that there are four factors used to determine the force of muscle contraction. The number of fibers, the size of those fibers, the frequency of stimulation, and the degree of muscle stretch. These topics of PhysioX are also provided in the textbook, and though we didn't spend time lecturing on them, 
you will have ample opportunity to practice them as you work through your physio -X activities do this week as well as do next week. And so with this slide, this ends week seven lecture. We'll come back in week eight to discuss a bit of chapter 10 in a very short lecture. You should also be spending time with your muscle checklist and understanding muscles, not only being able to name them, but providing their action, providing their origin, and providing their insertion. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And meanwhile, make it a great day.